Okay, it's good to see you out on a Wednesday night, and it's an honor to be here with you tonight. Just to give you a little bit of background of, of who I am, if you've uh, never been at mrm.org or, or anything like that, let me just tell you right up front, I was never LDS. I, I was never a Mormon. I, I grew up as a very uh, pompous sinner, and I was pretty good at it. And, uh, but it wasn't until 1973 when I, I came to meet the Lord himself, and he called me unto himself, you might say, exposed my unrighteousness, and at the same time declared his righteousness. I saw myself as a sinner, put my trust in what he did on my behalf, and it's just been a, a great ride ever since. And what's interesting is I grew up with Mormons. A lot of my friends growing up in California were LDS. What's uh, fascinating about that story is they never tried to convert me. They never talked to me about their faith. Uh, I was invited to a knot tying class at the local ward, play basketball at the local ward and such, but they never really tried to convert me to their faith. I became a Christian in 1973, and then all of a sudden my Christian acquaint or my Mormon acquaintances that I had at that time all of a sudden started talking to me about religious issues. And I'm a brand new Christian. I'm as dumb as dirt. I don't know a lot of whole, uh, what I'm supposed to believe. Uh, all I had was a, a Bible as a reference, and I noticed that as I was talking to my Mormon friends, the more they kept bringing up some things, something just didn't seem right. And if you've ever gone through an experience like that, you could probably relate to that. Something just didn't seem right. And it was through going back and studying what the Word of God had to say on some of these issues that I started to realize, boy, you know, as much as I love my friends, and I'll tell you, I never had a bad experience growing up with Mormons. I remember we were standing out during the Olympics. I was at the north side of, of the uh, on North Temple, across from the conference center, and they were having a big thing going on that night, and people were coming out, and we were handing out you know, our Temple Square visitor guides. And uh, a woman came up to me, and she said, did somebody hurt you? I says, that caught me off guard. I'd never heard that before. And I went, no. In fact, all my experiences growing up with my Mormon friends were positive. It's, not, it's got nothing to do with any animosity towards people. It's just a concern for people and the issue of truth. And that's really what it's all about. Uh, you can imagine doing what I do for as long as I have. I've been studying Mormonism since I became a Christian, right after, in 1973, 74, around that time. Founded Mormonism Research Ministry in 1979. And it's, it's not uncommon to have Mormons write me or to say to my face, well, you're an anti-Mormon. And I think there's probably nothing more offensive to say to me than that, because I don't believe that I'm against Mormons at all. In fact, I've actually told many Mormons I could probably be your best friend because I'm not afraid to tell you what the Word of God has to say and about the predicament that I think you are in. Your other, your other so-called friends might not tell you this, but I'm willing to do that. I'm even willing to risk an earthly friendship to do that. So I am really, if you're here tonight and you're LDS, don't look at me as an enemy because I certainly am not. One of the things that we often hear, and if you've ever been out witnessing with Mormons or two Mormons and you're talking to them one-on-one, -on -one, and if you invited a Mormon to come here tonight, and the response was probably something like, well, if you want to know about Mormonism, you should ask a Mormon. And I'm not one, so I would be disqualified in their eyes. But I want you to know, most of what we are going to be looking at tonight are quotations from Mormons. We're going to be looking at what they have said about what they believe and what they think everyone else ought to be believing. Most of the things that we're going to be looking at tonight. So anyway... We're going to ask the question, is Christianity Mormonism? And you're going to understand why I use that title. But first of all, let me start with this quotation. This is one of the non-Mormon quotations that I'm going to be looking at. This is Benjamin Breckenridge Warfield, better known as B.B. Warfield. And you can understand why with a name like Benjamin Breckenridge, why he went by B.B. Well, B.B. Warfield was a... Uh, professor of theology at Princeton up until his death in 1921. And he made this, what I think is a very profound statement. He said, if everything that is called Christianity in these days is Christianity, then there is no such thing as Christianity. A name applied indiscriminately to everything 
designates nothing. And I think he's absolutely correct on that. And, and if he's saying this back before 1921, you can imagine how confusing that must be nowadays. And, and I have to agree that so many things now are given the label Christian that it almost becomes overwhelming and it actually, sadly, becomes comical in a certain way because there were always certain parameters that define Christianity and unfortunately a lot of those parameters, those borders have been jumped to where now, no matter what you believe, if a person wants to claim to be a Christian in our politically correct society, you almost have to believe him and just go along with it because to question him on that is akin to hatred. Hatred. I've been accused of that many times. Because I might disagree with someone on a particular issue, it's because I have a hatred for them. Let me just say, that's silly. It's just silly. Let's go on. Brigham Young, the second president of the Mormon Church, and I might add, I don't always agree with Brigham Young on a lot of things, but this is one statement where Brigham and I would certainly agree. He said, if I should hear a man advocate the erroneous principles he may have imbibed through education and oppose those principles, some might imagine that I was opposed to that man, when in fact I am only opposed to every evil and erroneous principle he advances. Now, do you understand what Brigham Young is saying here? He is saying, and if you're LDS tonight, remember, this is your second prophet seer and revelator, and he is saying that we might have disagreements on certain principles or issues, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we are opposed to the individual that brings those particular principles and issues. We just disagree with the principle or issue. It's not a personal thing. It's not animosity, and it certainly isn't hatred. Let's look at some basic stats. What are we dealing with here? If we are going to want to talk to our LDS friends and loved ones in an intelligent way, we need to know a little bit about them, a little bit of where they're coming from, a little bit about the, the history of the LDS church. Because in Mormonism, everything revolves around the church. The church is everything. Well, we began in 1830, had a mere membership of six people, primarily Joseph Smith and five of his friends. They reached their first million in 1947. Uh, Reverend Moon did that a lot faster. Uh, the Mormons, it took them a little while, but finally they, they reached their first million in 1947. Currently have a membership of around 13 and a half million people. They have about 54,000 active missionaries. There would be more than that if we included a lot of the retired couples that work at a lot of the visitor centers and such. I'm just giving you a, a round number, it's not precise. And currently they have 130 operating temples with several others either announced or under construction. In fact, they just opened two temples in the area where I live in the Salt Lake Valley. One of the arguments that we often hear when we're talking to our Mormon friends, and I've heard this many times, is one of the arguments they will use to say that God is smiling upon the Mormon church is because of its rapid growth. And there's no doubt that the Mormon church has a pretty good uh, increase in membership every year. However, we need to look at the convert baptism rate in order to get a good picture of this, because as you know, Mormons are generally known for having large families, and a lot of these large families, of course, when these children turn eight years of age, then they are now allowed, uh, at, by reaching the uh, age of accountability, to be baptized into the Mormon church. And so I'm not really counting those. I think if we really want to understand how fast this church is growing, we need to look at the convert baptism rate. You will notice by looking at that first number, 1990, uh, they've reached 330,877 converts to the Mormon church. Notice the dates coming after that, 1991, 92, 93, on down to last year. We don't have the numbers for 2009 as of yet. We will in a few months. But you'll notice something. They have never reached the number that they had in 1990. That's telling. You would think with this continual growth being compounded and sending missionaries out and all that, that the number would be increasing somewhat, at least you know, somewhat exponentially over the years. But that's not what's happening. 
we're finding that the, the growth rate of the Mormon church is actually static. And as you can see from the numbers, sometimes they actually go down quite significantly. I have no idea what next year is going, or 2009 is going to look like. But the, it's a myth to think that the Mormon church is the fastest growing church in the world. And besides, I wouldn't say that that's a good argument for truth anyway. If the Mormon church only had 10 members, if they were true, they're true. It doesn't matter how many people you have. If, they have. if what they have is truth, it's true. End of story. But that's not a good argument to say that the reason we are the true church is because look at how God is smiling on us and how we are growing so rapidly. This is Bruce McConkie. Bruce McConkie was a Mormon apostle. He died in the mid-1980s. He was considered by his peers in the leadership in the LDS church as being quite an expert on Mormon theology. Um, there's no doubt that he understood very clearly what Mormonism teaches and what Mormon people are supposed to believe. His sermons were very authoritative if you were to listen to him or read his sermons or even read his books. He made a comment, and, and now you'll probably understand the question that I asked at the beginning. He said, Mormonism is Christianity. Christianity is Mormonism. They are one and the same, and they are not to be distinguished from each other in the minutest detail. Mormons are true Christians. Mormons are true Christians. Now, not being LDS, not being a Mormon, and reading this, I have to ask myself, well, if I'm not a Mormon and Mormons are true Christians, what does that say about my claim for Christianity? Most Mormons will be very polite if you were to ask this kind of a question. And they would say, well, yeah, we'll, we'll agree that you're Christian. But they have this phrase that I've heard several times. They'll say, well, and they probably wouldn't say it to your face, but they do say it among themselves. You know, we're kind of university level where you're still high school level. Now you can understand why they don't often say that to your face. That is quite offensive. I, I mean, okay. Um, all right. But if Mormons are true Christians and you're not a Mormon, wouldn't that mean that you're a false Christian or at least not a real Christian? In other words, they're really, they're slamming our claim for Christianity. And you know, this might surprise you, that doesn't bother me so much if that's what they really believe. If that's what they really believe, then we have to take it from there. That is the hand that has dealt us and now we have to go on from that point if that's their position. But you see, that's the problem. Many times as Christians, we will take what someone says to us, and that's the end of the story. We would just much rather believe what they've told us because we don't want to risk upsetting the person that we might be talking to in order to find out exactly where is this person? Where are they in light of eternity? What do they really believe? Are the things that they believe really considered Christianity? If not, is it right to just allow someone to say that without a challenge? I don't think so. I don't think the New Testament would even support such a position. Gordon Hinckley was the 15th president of the Mormon Church, wrote a pamphlet back in 1976 called What of the Mormons? Uh, in it, he says, they, and I put in brackets Mormons because that's the context of what he's saying. He says, Mormons are generally classed as Protestants since they are not Catholic. Actually, they are no closer to Protestantism than they are to Catholicism. Neither historically nor on the basis of modern association, theology, or practice can they be grouped with either. Suffice it to say that it's theology its organization and its practices are in many respects entirely unique, notice that phrase, among today's Christian denominations. What is he telling us? He's saying that in what we believe and how we practice, how we're organized, we are unique. In other words, there's nothing like them anywhere. This is why the Mormon church holds the position that they are the only true church on the face of the earth and all other churches are in what they call a state of apostasy. 
they have a phrase called the complete apostasy that we're going to be talking about a little bit later. Now, one thing I find that whenever you challenge a Latter-day Saint's claim to Christianity, they usually get very upset. Um, they get real upset. And uh, there's one reason why, I think. I have found in my discussions with Latter-day Saints that many times they equate being a Christian with being a good person. And I'm not saying that if you claim to be a Christian that you shouldn't be a good person, but I'm certainly not saying that if I question your claim to Christianity, I'm not also implying that you're a bad person. You follow me on that? I'm not saying that. I'm merely saying that what a person might believe does not fall within the ballpark of what has been known as Christianity. That's all I'm saying. I'm not implying that they are bad people. In fact, I've told many Latter-day Saints, I would not be surprised if your life was probably more stellar than mine in many areas. I'm not doubting that. It could very well be true. But I'm not implying that I think you're a bad person just because I'm questioning your claim to Christianity. Brigham Young said, should you ask why we differ from other Christians, as they are called, it is simply because they are not Christians, as the New Testament defines Christianity. So here's Brigham Young saying, we're not Christians, and I'm not upset about that. That's fine. If that's what they believe, again, that's my starting point. That's where I have to go, and that's what I have to address. I don't get upset by that. I, I know where I am in light of eternity. I, I know what I believe as far as what the New Testament teaches. And so this doesn't bother me. If that's his position, that's his position. Ezra Taft Benson, the 13th president of the Mormon church, said, this is not just a, another church. This is not just one of a family of Christian churches. This is the church and kingdom of God, the only true church upon the face of the earth, according to the Lord's own words. And what he means by that, he's quoting from the Doctrine and Covenants, which is one portion of Mormon scripture. It's a compilation of a lot of latter-day revelations, primarily given to Joseph Smith, the, the founder of the Mormon movement. In section one, it actually says this, that, the, that Joseph Smith's church, the church that he founded, is the only one with whom God is well-pleased. This is where Ezra Taft Benson is getting this comment. Now, as I've mentioned, you have to know something about Joseph Smith if you're going to speak intelligently with your Latter-day Saint friends. Smith was born in 1805, uh, died in 1844. He was shot to death at Carthage Jail. I don't have time to go into a lot of that history behind it, but suffice it to say, because of his death, Mormons do consider him to be a, pro uh, a martyr. And they've elevated Joseph Smith, however, to a, a very uncomfortable level, I think. They will insist that they do not worship him, and I don't think they really do. Um, there are some hymns that I find very uncomfortable. But in, uh, in 2001, in the LDS Church News, March 17th, it read, Joseph Smith was a prophet, and aspirations to the contrary cannot controvert that fact. Anyone who has concern for the welfare of his eternal soul should give attention to this message. Every man who has lived since the days of Joseph Smith is subject to accepting him as a prophet of God in order to enter into our Heavenly Father's presence. It's not enough to say you believe in Jesus, you have to believe in Joseph. If you hope to receive the best the Mormon God has for you, that is very clear. In a, a church manual called Search These Commandments, came out in 1984, page 133, it says, No man or woman in this dispensation will ever enter, enter into the celestial kingdom of God. That's the highest level of Mormon heaven. There are three levels. You won't enter into the celestial kingdom of God without the consent of Joseph Smith. That's where the statement ends in the manual, but if you were to go back to the source from where the manual is getting this actual quotation, it goes on to say, from that day that the priesthood was taken from the earth to the winding up scene of all things, every man and woman must have the certificate of Joseph Smith Jr. as a passport to their entrance into the mansion where God and Christ are. I with you and you with me, this is Brigham Young speaking, I cannot go there without his consent. 
And I've had Mormons tell me that. I remember talking with a gentleman in his front yard in Utah. And I was discussing some of these issues about Joseph Smith with him in a very, very pleasant conversation. And uh, finally, I, I guess he got a little annoyed with some of the things that I was bringing up. And he told me to be very careful because Joseph Smith was going to be my judge. I politely explained to him about how the Father has given the Son judgment, and it's Jesus I was more worried about than Joseph Smith, and at that time his wife chimed in and said, yes, but Joseph Smith is on the board. <laughs> I don't know where they get this in Scripture, uh, but nonetheless, this is what they actually believed and related to me in the conversation. Mormonism goes back... Even before it was officially founded, it, it goes back on an official level to what was known as an 1820 revival or an 1820 religious excitement. Let me read you from Joseph Smith's history very quickly. Smith writes, sometime in the second year after our removal to Manchester, there was in the place where we lived an unusual excitement on the subject of religion. Great multitudes united themselves to the re different religious parties. It was seen that the seemingly good feelings of both the priests and the converts were more pretended than real, for a scene of great confusion and bad feeling ensued. I was at this time in my 15th year. While I was laboring upon the extreme difficulties caused by the contest of these parties of religionists, I was one day reading the Epistle of James, first chapter, fifth verse. At length, I came to the conclusion that I must either remain in darkness and confusion or else I must do as James directs, that is, ask of God. And so what Joseph Smith does with this passage is he goes out into some woods to pray and to ask God which of all the churches were true. As he prays this prayer, he says, I retired to the woods to make the attempt. I saw two personages, he says. One of them called, spake unto me, calling me by name, and said, pointing to the other, This is my beloved son, hear him. I asked the personages who stood above me in the light which of all the sects was right and which I should join. I was answered that I must join none of them, for they were all wrong. And the personage who addressed me said that all their creeds were an abomination in his sight and that those professors were all corrupt. Should this not concern us as Christians? Of course it should. Joseph Smith is claiming that he got a divine message saying that our creeds are an abomination and that all of our churches are wrong and that all of our professors, our pastors, our seminary teachers, well, some of them could be, I guess, in some degree. It depends on which seminary you're going to. But nonetheless, these professors are all corrupt. Now, why shouldn't we take an offense at that and want to respond to that? And yet, I find many times, while Mormons get very upset with me personally because I ask these questions, they seem to want to brush aside the fact that Joseph Smith claimed in his first vision that what I believe in the creeds are, is an abomination, my church is wrong, and my pastor is corrupt. And you know what they'll say? Well, that's not me saying that. God said that. That's the whole debate. I don't believe God said that. That's what we're trying to find out here. Did God really say that? Well, according to Joseph Smith, that even becomes questionable. Gordon Hinckley placed such an emphasis on the first vision, he said this, I would like to say that this cause is either true or false. Either this is the kingdom of God or it is a sham and a delusion. Either Joseph talked with the Father and the Son or he did not. If he did not, we are engaged in blasphemy. Hinckley seemed to understand the stakes. He seems to really understand the issue. And another time, he said, if the first vision was true, if it actually happened, then the Book of Mormon is true. Then we have the priesthood. Then we have the church organization and all of the other keys and blessings of authority which we say we have. If the first vision did not occur, then we are involved in a great sham. It is just that simple. I would tend to agree. I would say, yeah, you probably are right in that. But here we have a number of problems. First of all, the religious excitement that Joseph Smith describes that actually led him to James 1.5 and ultimately to go out into the woods and pray which church is true didn't take place in 1820. The one he describes took place in 1824. Now you might not think that's a real big issue, 
But it certainly is, because if you're going to change the date, it disrupts Smith's chronology. For example, he claims in his testimony that he was persecuted for telling this story as an obscure boy only between 14 and 15 years of age. If it actually took place in 1824, he merely got the date wrong, he would have been a young man of around 18, not a real naive boy of around 14 or 15. Not only that, Smith claimed that an angel appeared to him named Moroni in 1823 and told him about the plates that contained the Book of Mormon. This would have been three years after he learned that all the churches were true, or, or were wrong, excuse me. If the revival really took place in 1824, then Smith's encounter with Moroni would have really been his first vision. And this understanding of all the churches being wrong, he certainly wouldn't have got from his encounter with God the Father and Jesus, according to his story. Mormon apologists often point to a, a Methodist camp meeting that took place in 1820. I've heard this from several Mormon apologists. But if you look at the details from this Methodist camp meeting that took place in 1820, it doesn't match what Joseph Smith describes in his own testimony, so that has to be thrown out. It's not the same thing. So we have some real problems with the dating. We also have a problem with Joseph Smith's translation of Exodus 33:20. In uh, 1830, Joseph Smith was commanded of God to retranslate the Bible because, as Mormons will often say, the Bible has been corrupted over the years and can't be trusted. Article 8 in the Articles of Faith say that we believe the Bible as far as it's translated correctly. So God's allegedly told Joseph Smith to start a translation. He does this, and if we look at Exodus 33:20 in his translation, which according to his own words he finished in 1833, it reads, And he said unto Moses, Thou canst not see my face at this time, lest mine anger is kindled against thee also, and I destroy thee and thy people. For there shall no man among them see me at this time and live, for they are exceeding sinful, and no sinful man hath at any time, neither shall there be any sinful man at any time, that shall see my face and live. What's interesting about this references to being sinful and not seeing God's face is that if you read Joseph Smith's testimony, he talks about how he was a sinful person, how he went to God, especially in his 1832 diary account. Uh, he talks about his sinfulness, and this is why he went to, to God as well. So we have to ask, well, why the apparent contradiction then? Well, it's because I, I personally believe that the first vision, as it's understood by majority of Latter-day Saints, was a later invention. It wasn't something that Joseph Smith was telling all the time. It came about over time as he kind of embellished the story. Listen to this statement made by a BYU professor, James B. Allen. He's a Mormon historian. He said, apparently not until 1843, when the New York Spectator printed a reporter's account of an interview with Joseph Smith, did a non-Mormon source publish any reference to the story of the first vision. As far as Mormon literature is concerned, there was apparently no reference to Joseph Smith's first vision in any published material in the 1830s. From all this, it would appear that the general church membership did not receive information about the first vision until the 1840s. Now, that would be two decades after it allegedly happened. Believe me, if you had an encounter with the Almighty, wouldn't you tell people about that? Wouldn't that be something to say? I mean, if it's really that big of an issue, especially as Gordon Hinckley says, you would think so. And it says... It wasn't until the 1840s and that the story certainly does not hold the prominent place in Mormon thought that it does today. But what do we do with his 1832 diary? It was known as the Strange Account. In Joseph Smith's own 1832 diary, he doesn't tell the same story that Mormons are led to believe today. This is what he says actually took place when he went out into the woods to pray. He said, while in the attitude of calling upon the Lord in the 16th year of my age, not between 14 and 15, a pillar of fire scratched out light, a pillar of light above the brightness of the sun at noonday came down from above and rested upon me, and I was filled with the Spirit of God. And the Lord opened the heavens upon me, and I saw the Lord, and he spake unto me, saying, Joseph, my son, thy sins are forgiven thee. Notice we have no mention of God the Father here at all. It was only the Lord. 
If you read other LDS leaders that were contemporary with Joseph Smith, you'll find they don't mention God the Father either. In fact, sometimes they don't even mention the Lord. They'll mention that angels showed up or an angel showed up. In other words, there's no real corroboration between all these stories. And you'll also notice, again, keep in mind, he claims he's 16 years old, it's only the Lord that appears, and it's not the Father and the Son. Remember, it was Hinckley who said, if the Father and the Son did not appear, then what we believe is a great blasphemy. But one part about that first vision that Mormons do hold on to to this day, very, very tightly, and that is the idea of a great apostasy. Because according to this account that Mormons believe today, the official version of the first vision, one of the things that was told them was what? All the churches were wrong, the creeds were an abomination, and their professors are corrupt. That idea not only permeates, perme permeates Mormon thought in their own scriptures, it, it, it's uh, within Mormon thought and Mormon writings, and was actually a portion of the Mormon temple ceremony for a number of years. There was a character in the temple endowment ceremony that was portraying a Christian minister who was actually bought off by a character who was Lucifer to preach false doctrine. That's how the Mormon church characterized Christian pastors as hirelings of Satan. This was removed in April of 1990. Uh, it was uh, very much toned down, went through a great revision in, in, in 1990, did I say 1890, 1990. And, uh, but still, even though it was removed or expunged from the Temple Endowment Ceremony, it is still a part of Mormon thought today. Just think about it. Whenever the Mormon church claims, by, whenever its leaders speak in conference or wherever, and they insist that they are the only true church, they're implying your church is false. It's very simple. It's not, it, you know, it's not rocket science. B.H. Roberts, who was an LDS 70, also a church historian said that nothing less than a complete apostasy from the Christian religion would warrant the establishment of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. In other words, if there was not a complete apostasy of the Christian faith, there would be no need for the Mormon church to exist. That is very profound. What I, what I mean by that is, if you talk with a lot of apologists today, or even some BYU professors, who for one reason or another, I, I can't explain why because I don't know their hearts, but they're trying very hard to sound evangelical. And it becomes very confusing talking to many of these apologists because they, they seem to go out of their way to obfuscate what Mormon leaders have actually said on things they are supposed to believe and have actually been very clear about this. And now you have many times Latter-day Saints trying, like one Mormon apologist recently was insisting that his salvation was based entirely upon grace. Entirely upon grace. I mean, I hear things like this, knowing what Mormon leaders have actually said over the years on this issue, and I can't help but wonder, what is this person trying to do? They, they can't be that ignorant I, I can only assume they're really trying to deceive me because that's not what Mormon leaders have taught. That's not what Mormon scripture teaches. It's certainly not what Joseph Smith taught. But yet we hear this over and over again. I mean, let me ask for a show of hands. How many of you have ever talked with a Latter-day Saint and they said to you, well, we're Christians just like you? <laughs> I get this wherever I go. I don't understand this. Because it's not really true. And, and I've often kidded around with them. I said, well, if you're a Christian like me, I guess I'm a Mormon like you. <laughs> what is amazing then is how the conversation tends to turn because, well, no, that's not true. <laughs> and I'll say, why not? Well, you don't believe the things that make a Mormon what they are. You don't believe Joseph Smith is a prophet of God. You don't believe men can become gods. You don't believe the Book of Mormon is the word of God. So you can't be a Mormon because you don't believe things that, are, that Mormons believe. I go, that's interesting because yet you claim to be a Christian, but yet you don't believe there's one God. You don't believe in salvation by grace through faith. You don't believe the Bible is in the er errant word of God. Uh, you don't believe that there's only a heaven and a hell. I said, so... So you don't believe the things that historically have made Christians what they are, but yet you want the title of Christian. Well, if you want the title of Christian, I'm going to call myself a Mormon. <laughs> of course, they don't agree with that, okay? 
They can't get away from this call, uh, claim for the complete apostasy because it's in their scripture. 1 Nephi 14.10 says, Behold, there are saved two churches only. The one is the church of the Lamb of God, and the other is the church of the devil. This isn't rocket science, folks. There's only two churches according to the Book of Mormon. One is the church of the Lamb of God, the other is the church of the devil. Wherefore, whoso belongeth not to the church of the Lamb of God belongeth to that great church which is the mother of abominations. Now, when we look at this, it becomes very clear where the Mormon church is. If we don't belong to the Mormon church or the church of the Lamb of God, there's only one other choice as to which church we belong to, and that would be the church of the devil. Should this not concern us that Mormons would be thinking this about this? I mean, uh, I mean, again, if that's what they want to believe, that's their prerogative. But I think it's, it's not fair to us to think that of us without allowing us at least a chance for rebuttal. And just so you know that I'm not taking this out of context, this is Bruce McConkie, a Mormon theologian, explaining what that passage means. He says, what is the church of the devil in our day, and where is the seat of her power? It is communism, it is Islam, it is Buddhism, it is modern Christianity in all its parts. It is Germany under Hitler, Russia under Stalin, and Italy under Mussolini. Quite a hall of fame there, isn't that? Uh, to be placed right in the middle of that, it is modern Christianity in all its parts. The reason I say this and what we're going to be doing as we look in the, in the next several sessions is that there are, in fact, some very significant differences between what we as evangelical Christians believe from the New Testament and what Mormons have been told to believe, not only from their standard works, the Bible, the Book of Mormon, Doctrine and Covenants, and Pearl of Great Price, but also from the teachings of what they call modern-day revelation. That's what we're going to be looking at. I hope you leave the building with a greater sense of compassion for your Mormon neighbors and friends. And if you don't, then I have failed in what I'm trying to accomplish here tonight. I'm not wanting to, you to leave these doors thinking little of the Mormon people. I would hope that you would look at some of the things that they've been told to believe and hopefully have a greater compassion for them as individuals and hopefully want to share with them New Testament truths that will ultimately allow them to have that peace that passes all understanding that I hope you as a professing Christian also possess. That's what we're doing here. My, my reason for being a missionary to the Mormon people, as I said, is not because I dislike Mormons, because I don't. I have the same kind of compassion to, to minister in Utah as a Christian, ministry, uh, a Christian minister or missionary has for the Chinese people when he ministers in China or for the African people if he ministers in Africa. There's no difference. It just God has called me to this people group, and that's where I am. And because of a great love that and, and concern that I have for them, I do what I do. And I'm hopefully living in the culture that, in which you live, because we know Idaho has, is, is almost like Utah when it comes to the amount of Mormons living in a given area. Um, you can't escape it. Um, you probably, if you're not married to one, you're friends with one, or you're relatives with one. That's what we're going to hope to be doing. Next week, we'll be looking at who is the God of Mormonism? What is the Godhead of Mormonism? What's it all about? What have Mormon leaders taught or believed concerning the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and such? Let's close in prayer. I'll give it back to um, the worship band. Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for the mercy that you have poured upon us, though undeserving as we are. We come before you realizing that you are our unblemished sacrifice. All our hope and all our trust is in you and you alone. We thank you for what you've done in our lives. We thank you for that gift of salvation that is truly a gift. We thank you for what is done to open our eyes and to recognize you for who you really are, the creator of all things, including ourselves, the one who loves us so much that he died, that you died on our behalf. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.